Every business, regardless of its size, must provide its employees with safe working conditions. And considering the range of potential hazards from asbestos to slippery stairs to excessive noise, that can be difficult for a small business. And why should everyone be so concerned about job safety and health? Because each year, approximately 6,000 employees in this country die from workplace injuries, while another 50,000 die from illnesses caused by exposure to workplace hazards. In addition, 6 million workers suffer non-fatal workplace injuries at an annual cost to U.S. businesses of more than $125 billion. Standards and rules for safe working conditions, tools, equipment, facilities, and processes are set by the Labor Department's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA. OSHA standards apply to every private employer with one or more employees except for those in industries covered by other federal job safety legislation. Today, roughly 93 million employees across the country are protected by state and federal OSHA programs. But even with adequate safety measures, accidents do happen. Today, the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in this new network TV special, Justice in America, Louis Vincent's story. To examine how Romani, Palai, and Jason Buckle, partners at Buckle, Levisor, Palai, and Beeman, and Elizabeth Tarasi and Louis Tarasi, partners at Tarasi and Tarasi, successfully got justice for Vincent. Here's Louis Vincent's lawyers to tell you some of the major legal challenges they faced in this case. Safety in the workplace is extremely important. For the simple reason, not only is it good for the company to have safe working environments for its employees, but also for the very practical matter that the company creates liability for itself when it doesn't have good safety. This particular case is a perfect example, Louis Vincent, PBS. Here's an employee from another company who comes onto their premises and, and is an unsafe condition created by this company, and therefore they wind up with extensive liability to Louis Vincent as a result of the negligence of their employees that they didn't properly train or direct. In Mr. Vincent's case, they had protocols, they weren't followed, and Mr. Vincent was seriously hurt. Now the company obviously has these protocols, and if they had followed those, there wouldn't have been an injury here. For every worker in the United States out there now listening to this, when you're injured in a job, you two things you do. You report immediately to your employer, because you should be entitled for workman's compensation. This is for all workers. If, if you're injured on the job, Obviously, the first thing is your medical attention. You need to get the medical attention you need. But second, you really need to hire an attorney because hiring an attorney will allow you to preserve your workers if you have to file a workers' compensation claim. So you should look at all aspects of what happened. Workman's compensation, medical bills, your lost income, your lost future, what you've suffered, your pain and suffering, and what this, if your injury was caused by a third party, what actions and rights you have against them. An attorney can guide you through that process. We have, we've had several occasions where insurance companies will lead clients on thinking that they have an actual workers' compensation claim. My best advice to you is you definitely should seek legal advice to find out what your rights are. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It is my great pleasure to introduce Lou Teresi Jr. and Jason Buckle to the show. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you very much. Tell our audience a little bit about your two separate firms. Tell our audience a little bit about your law firm first, and then you, Jason. My law firm now consists of myself and my daughter. She's an outstanding attorney. Both, both of them are listed in the best lawyers in America. I personally am the former president of Pennsylvania Trial Lawyers, Western Pennsylvania Trial Lawyers, I am a member of the International Society of Barristers, 650 in the world by invitation only. I'm a board certified 
civil trial specialist. Okay, what type of cases do you generally handle? Civil litigation of all types, very personal injury, medical malpractice, class actions, mass torts, condemnation, medical malpractice. Always representing the plaintiff, little guy. I always represent the people all my life. All right, and Jason? We are firm. What is the name of your firm? Buckle, Levasseur, Pillai, and Beeman. Uh, we're located not here in uh, in Pittsburgh where this case took place, but uh, our client, Louis Vincent, is, is from our home area, which is Western Maryland, uh, about two hours from here in, in, in Pittsburgh where the case was tried. Uh, our firm, we have five attorneys, uh, multiple offices throughout the state of Maryland, and we predominantly do somewhat similar to what Lou just described. Uh, a lot of this complex civil litigation from personal injury and wrongful death claims to construction litigation, business litigation, contractual and real property based litigation. Uh, but it's our, our, our practice, some workers' compensation as well. The, yeah. the, the historic uh, roots of our firm, we're doing a tremendous amount of workers' compensation for the, the workers in many of the industries throughout Western Maryland and our neighboring states that have kind of faded over the years. But we still have a decent amount of that. Um, today we're here on a personal injury case. Yeah. A gentleman by the name of Louis Vincent uh, was injured. Tell our audience a little bit about the facts. Louis um, is a is a wonderful guy, salt of the earth guy. He was a a truck driver, an over the road truck driver, hauling heavy materials uh, for a pipe and steel company based in Western Maryland, and driving and, and delivering materials to a variety of industries, including coal facilities and other things throughout Western Pennsylvania, Western Maryland, into West Virginia. Uh, and when Lewis was injured, he had delivered a, a, a steel I-beam, essentially weighed a couple of tons. I mean, if you can picture that, yeah. you know, you imagine being built into buildings and uh, skyscrapers. He was delivering that along with some other steel products on the bed of his truck uh, to a facility owned by a company called PBS Coles. And he, so he was delivering uh, this I-beam and some other materials to PBS Coles here in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, and it was, it was raining lightly that day. And so, of course, he had a tarp over top of the, the steel and iron products so that they wouldn't rust, they wouldn't, they wouldn't get wet. When uh, the crew came out from PBS Coles to unload his, his vehicle, his tractor trailer, they had to use a very large forklift, obviously, to get this uh, I-beam in particular off. And they, the, the evidence showed, and the, and the jury certainly believed that the facts were pretty clear, that the PBS Coles employees actually uh, encouraged, insisted that Lewis get out of his vehicle uh, and it's, it's not very safe to do that in, in that kind of a work situation, but they wanted him to get out. Their policy was truck, truck drivers weren't supposed to get out, but they kind of made him get out, come out, untarp his, his load. They asked him to take the tarp off. They asked him to, to take the top bar, tarp off to assist in things. And when they came up with this very large forklift to remove the I-beam, they didn't secure the I-beam on... The, the tines of the forklift. The I-beam was, was still moving, it was not secured, it was not stable. And they began to back the I-beam away and you know, unbeknownst to Lewis, who was simply there at their direction, standing by his truck, having removed the tarp, uh, the I-beam tumbled off of the end of the, the forklift and fell directly on Lewis and, and could have killed him. If it would have been higher, if it would have been up around his head, neck area, likely would have killed him. How much did it weigh? The estimate is about two tons. Wow. Uh, you know, that's the entire weight of it, not just the, the one section that hit him. It's very long if you yeah. picture it in your head. But uh, it, it hit him, drove him into the ground. Uh, he had a, a, it was generally medically described as a crush injury of his hip, broken bones, facial lacerations. Uh, I think if you, if you had the opportunity to listen to Lewis's testimony, you know, he was scared to death. Uh, he thought he was going to die. I think all the men who were there at the time were scared to death when this happened. So it was a very serious injury. What were some of the strategies you had to pursue to win this case and you won the case? Well, in Pennsylvania, we have comparative negligence. And if you have any negligence on the part of the injured party, the plaintiff in this case, Lewis Vincent, more than 50%, then he gets a zero. Yeah. And they argued repeatedly in the, the testimony of, their, of this one forklift guy was that Lewis Vincent told them when to lift the I-beam. But we had the deposition and the sworn testimony in court of the co-worker with this I-beam operator for the defendant, PBS, who said under oath in open court that he was the one that told the I-beam operator when to lift the I-beam. Right. And he said that he signaled to him to lift it. And when I took his testimony and cross-examined him, I asked him, where was Louis Vincent when this happened? He didn't know where he was. So therefore, 
to remove the idea that Lewis Vincent was doing anything wrong. And Lewis Vincent himself was a good witness, testified that he was doing his job on tarping this high beam, getting it ready to be lifted when this thing was lifted. And of course, it was not secured and it rolled off and fell on him and it could have killed him. And, and frankly, that's the essence of the case was that there was no negligence by Lewis Vincent, although in fact, the jury did find him 5% negligent. Okay, so there was another issue about safety training, wasn't yeah. there? Let's yeah. talk about that because the, in the defense side said that he should have had the training, right? right. In fact, it, when he had the I-beam on him, was crushing him, someone asked him whether he had the training yet. Whether, whether he had the training. I, I, that, that definitely was some of the evidence that some of the PBS coal well, safety folks were out the there. <laughs> well, uh, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with corporate compliance yeah. and safety people, their first instinct sometimes is, you know, sort of cover their own position. Yeah. I mean, the guy's important. dying and they ask him whether he has safety and, training. And you know, that, <laughs> I think that affected the jury, too. We talked about that. I, I was in a position, I gave opening and closing statements in the case and, and talked about that at length. That most trials that I've been involved with, uh, I certainly haven't been involved in quite as many as Lou. He's, yeah. he's only a couple of years older than me. Right. But uh, most of the, the 30, 40 jury trials that I've been involved with, they all come down to what seems reasonable, what seems like that makes sense, and that's a common sense fact that people can relate to. If something seems crazy, if something seems odd, if something seems that that's not how a normal person would do it, it's not believable. And in this particular case, PBS Coles and, and their counsel, very good man from a very, very large firm here in Pittsburgh, uh, I believe a named partner at that firm, uh, they just took a position from day one that they were going to sell this story of it was somehow Lewis's fault, he was involved in it, he didn't know what he was doing. Let's talk about what motivates a defendant to take this to case, to, to trial. And one of them was the PBS's self-retention policy, right? Yes. Explain to our audience, Lou, what that means. The big problem they had here is they had, uh, they were self-insured for I think the first 500,000. That's correct. And therefore they did not want to get into that. So they were, uh, if they could get away from it, and they were offered. They offered us. I think the the maximum was two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which was ridiculous for his injuries. And I know Joe Bozik for years, the defense lawyer, tried many cases against his firm. And I told him he was very foolish to make take that position, because not only was Lewis Vincent a good man, but he was a good witness. Plus, he tried his best to get back on his feet. And as soon as he could do go back to work, he went back to work, even though. He had gone through several operations and still had pain, and had pain when he drove, but he still went back to work. Mm -hmm. And I, like a, my co-counsel just stated, I try cases on good common sense and what I think juries want to hear. Right. And they want to hear what they think makes sense. Yeah. And what made sense that this guy, who in the world would want an I-beam weighing two tons to drop on him? Right. Nobody. 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 Um, the unique aspects of this case were what? I think the unique aspect of it was the the desire by PBS Coles to to really sort of turn this into uh, a trial about Lewis Vincent. And, you know, I think that happens in, in, in some cases. It was, and it, and it really backfired. I, I know Lou and I and the entire team involved in the case were very confident as we went through discovery. There were depositions in numerous states of different employees. Lewis wasn't someone who was here looking for a handout. We weren't people here trying to sell something that wasn't real. Uh, their expert witness that, that I had cross-examined, I mean, literally got up and blamed the entire thing on Lewis Vincent and said, well, it had to be his fault. He had to, we had pictures of the truck in the area. He had to be standing here. He wasn't trained and, you know, it wasn't an act. Sometimes I know you've, you've dealt with hundreds, hundreds of trial lawyers, but sometimes people are acting. Right. I was, was very upset. Uh, I sat in the courtroom and literally as soon as he got finished, uh, you know, I was, to be fair, almost screaming at him right. that you want to blame this man, yeah. this man for having the eye beam fall on him based upon where you think he is on a pointer of, of a picture. Uh, it was offensive. And I think that the jury, uh, certainly by the verdict and, and the way they re uh, behaved and responded during the trial, they felt the same way we did, that it was it was offensive. So I think that's that's kind of what was unique about it. You had a large corporate defendant who had these these odd insurance issues in the background, never really was dealing with the case completely credibly, uh, and sort of came to trial and just tried to throw the kitchen sink against this 
this poor guy who was a truck driver doing his job, who really could have been killed very easily in this terrible accident. Tell us the end result. What was the verdict? 1,300,000. Now, after a verdict, a lot of companies appeal. The loser appeals. Did they, they appealed or they were going to appeal, correct? They had filed a, a post-trial motion uh, here in the trial court level, yeah. uh, and we essentially resolved the case for right. basically almost the entire verdict uh, yeah. to, to forestall an appeal through the Pennsylvania appellate system. Now, two of your other team members on this are two other lawyers we have here today, yes. and I want to bring them on. Um, would you tell our audience who they are? Sure. Ram Palai is a partner at our law firm. Uh, Ram and I actually have known each other our whole lives. We went to high school together. Uh, and Ram handled a tremendous amount of the pretrial discovery as well as some witnesses at trial. But he did uh, the bulk, probably, of the pretrial discovery of fact witnesses, corporate witnesses, things of that nature. And your daughter's here. My daughter is my partner, and she was a key person. Uh, with me when we prepared the case and also when we picked a jury. And by the way, we picked a jury, which is my theory in this area where uh, in you know, a case with this situation, I put, we picked a very, very well-educated jury. A great many of them were college graduates. And I find when you have a case that makes a lot of good common sense and involves human people and what they would do, you pick a smart jury. And you pick a jury that you think will understand what's going on and not be led astray by some statements trying to blame it all on a, a worker who is doing his job. Right. And her name is Beth. Beth. So let's bring him on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Beth Teresi and Romani Palai. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Tell our audience a little bit about um, what type of law you both practice, Romney? We do a general practice of law. We do a lot of personal injury. Uh, we do a lot of workers' compensation. How about yourself, Beth? Uh, we do general, general practice, uh, mainly uh, litigation, a lot of personal injury. Um, it being in Western Pennsylvania, we do a lot of uh, oil and gas yeah. um, cases. Uh, we do a lot of product liability, uh, wrongful death, um, and a little bit of medical malpractice. We don't do any workers' compensation, um, and um, we do uh, industrial accidents and uh, pretty uh, hurtful. When a plaintiff is really hurt, we handle a lot of those types of cases, auto accidents. This is a case of personal injury case for Lewis of Vincent, but it also is a case about workers' safety. Correct. Tell our audience a little bit about what an employee's rights are if they're injured on the job? Well, the employee, first of all, he has the workers' compensation realm, which we also represented Lewis in. Yeah. He has to file, we filed a claim with the commission, and he can go what's called get temporary total damages, where he will be paid two-thirds of his wages while he's off work. Okay, and if that is a permanent period of time, He's still going to get workers' compensation. If he's injured enough where he's found permanently totaled, he would be compensation for life. That's an administrative process, basically, right? You go in front of a commission. It's not a judge. It's not in a courtroom. Actually, his hearing was in a conference room at a hotel, and you present your evidence. The defense um, presents their evidence, and it's basically a commission making a determination. The next question I'm going to have is the last thing on somebody's mind when they're injured on the job site, and that is what must they do to ensure the evidence that they need that something happened that shouldn't have happened, and they suffered for that. When I, when, when, whenever, whenever a worker comes in, I've been injured on the job, what have they usually not done? Uh, gotten the names of the witnesses and every, everybody on the job that day. It's almost like an accident, a traffic accident. Yeah, yes, yes. You know, you get the name of the person that hits you, yes. insurance, right? Yes. Get everything, get the employer's name, who was on the... What, what about photographs? For example, in this particular case, um, Lewis was not supposed to be participating at all in uh, with the I-beam on the truck, mm -hmm. but he was asked to do that by the workers, right? Correct. Um, how do you get witnesses that are working for that PBS company, right, to testify against their own company to help Lewis? Believe it or not, you find out that a lot of people are still honest people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they saw how injured Lewis was, and um, they believed that something should be done. And I find that in a lot of cases, that people are still honest, 
and they tell the truth. I was going to say, we got uh, lucky here because this happened on a coal uh, on a coal mine facility. So MSHA, the Mine Safety Health Administration, came in and did a big investigation. So a lot of witnesses, witness names were there. They, so you were able to get their their information. Yeah, I submitted a freedom of information. How long did that take to get that information from? Surprisingly, you? very quick. We had it probably within thirty to sixty days. Wow. So they were not at all reluctant to give it to you. And yeah. is that their policy with anybody? Uh, so I, I know some people that have had some issues, but they were, you know, they redacted some stuff from there. But we were able to get, you know, what we needed. It showed all the citations against uh, PBS Coles. It had some witness statements in there. So it was very helpful. Yeah. In any case, when you file a case and you file it against PBS, um, you're gathering information called discovery. Yes. Okay. There comes a point in time when you say, let's maybe meet for a possible settlement because we've got all the evidence in the world that you guys are going to have to pay. The other side was reluctant to do that, correct? Yeah, and they were reluctant to do it because they were self-insured, right? Yes. They don't want to pay out. That's their money. They it's have. coming out of their pocket. Right. So they will pay a law firm a million dollars <laughs> to represent them, which is kind of counterintuitive, right? Counterproductive. Yeah, that to me didn't make any sense. What were his medical bills, Lewis's medical bills? I'm just curious. They were, I believe, hundred, maybe about $140,000, $150,000. Yeah. They were, they were up there. I mean, he had, he had a couple surgeries, you know. Re rehabilitation hospital. So. so let me ask you a question. You're injured. You go to the hospital, seriously injured. Your family comes there. What do you tell your family to do? Get a lawyer right away? That's what Lewis's family did. Because the other side, and let's be frank about this, the other side will destroy or hide evidence. They're not going to give it up, are they? No, they, they, it was difficult. We, uh, because also we were dealing originally with a Russian corporation, Severstal. And a Russian-owned corporation is saying, you don't have jurisdiction over us, right? That's, that's eventually what happened. We they did motions to dismiss in uh, federal court yeah. in Maryland. And, and that was their claim? Well, they were claiming they didn't have any minimum contacts with Maryland. Right. And we eventually, uh, after some negotiation, we agreed and we dismissed Severstall and just pursued against PBS Coles. Why would they do that? Well, we felt that our biggest battle or where, where everything happened would yeah. be with PBS Coles. And this also allowed us to keep the case or go in Pennsylvania and try the case. Because they were going to become, it wasn't worth the effort to keep them in. Is that it? We don't, we didn't think it was. We, from what we felt there would have been significant, there would have been sufficient coverage with PBS Coles. And that was our main defendant. Okay. Severstall was just an owner. And as a matter of fact, they sold the company midway through the litigation to a Canadian company, I believe. But that was just, let's, in, in an abundance of caution, let's name them. And then yes. through Severstall, we were considering trying it in Maryland. And we actually filed suit in Maryland and in Pennsylvania. What was the advantages of uh, uh, litigating the case in Pennsylvania? Is that where PBS, that's where the accident happened, correct? Correct. We were friendlier um, comparative negligence law. When clients or potential clients contact your offices, mm -hmm. and you probably get a lot of people who do this, um, well, how do you determine who you're going to eventually represent? What do you look for? Well, we want someone who seems, and I think my colleague was saying, Lewis seemed like a very honest person, very hardworking. And, you know, you look into the facts a little bit as to what happened. You know, his, his family wasn't really there. They weren't bugging us. They didn't come in. A lot of people will come in and all they want to talk about is money. Yeah. How much money am I going to get? Exactly. And it didn't seem like with him. You know, he wanted, you know, he obviously had some injuries. He wanted to get compensated for his injuries, but it, it was never anything about just me, 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 me. He was a very, Lewis is a very nice person, yeah. wanted to do what we wanted to do what was right for him. So after talking with him, and I think I met with his brother, we determined that, you know, we wanted to represent him. Is anything else you want to add to the case which made it significant? Um, well, he, he, was a, he was a good guy. Yeah. And when we met with him, um, we picked up that he would play in front of the jury very well, and that uh, he wasn't out to get a million dollars. He was out to, to seek justice and get himself compensated, and he was injured. I questioned Lewis on the stand, and I, we had him up there a little while, and it was just, he came across as just a very honest, hardworking person who had these pretty serious injuries, and never once was he up there sort of trying to play a pity party or anything. He was just, uh, this is what happened, you know, I, I still have pain, and I think the jury was very impressed that he was still working. If you, would, if you go through the, his injuries, his shoulder surgery, his 
crushed hip, his back, a lot of people would have been filing for disability and Lewis didn't want to do that. He, he wanted to work. Well, I want to thank both of you and the rest of your team for the success of this case and also for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.